most of you are aware of the exponential growth of computed tomography in medicine during the last two decades. The 10% annual increase in growth in MDCT imaging has far outstripped the growth of the U.S. population over the same time period. Fewer of you may be aware of the growth of comb beam CT use in dentistry. In little more than a decade, we've gone from the introduction of the technology to the availability of 30 different flavors of comb beam CT for maxillofacial imaging provided by 15 different manufacturers. We've had the opportunity to do dosimetry on a number of these uh, maxillofacial units. And they come in uh, different flavors, uh, the principal um, denominations being size of field of view. But there are some other parameter variables. Some of the units utilize a medical format, uh, which is to say a patient supine on a table. Others use uh, a more uh, traditional dental format not unlike the uh, dental panoramic device where the patient is seated or standing. Um, it, but it's interesting looking at the dosimetry of uh, these different devices. Um, when we divide them by uh, rough volume sizes, small, medium, and large, and compare them with state-of-the-art MDCT dosimetry. We see that first there's a significant range of dose produced by these devices. Similar fields do not provide similar doses. These indeed are dependent on other technical factors. But what we do see is that the high end of our dose ranges are comparable with doses encountered with state-of-the-art medical CT imaging. In this graphic, we see that a medium field of view MDCT scan covering head of the condyle to base of the chin produces a dose that's similar to the upper end of small, medium, and large field of view comb beam CT devices. In the absence of a consideration of biologic impact, dose is meaningless. And for this reason, we report the results of our studies in terms of effective dose. In 2007, the ICRP modified weights and weighted tissues associated with the calculation of effective dose. This was based largely on a reassessment of survivors of the Japanese atomic bombs and was based on availability of new information on mortality and morbidity from this group. This table demonstrates changes between the 1990 ICRP calculation of effective dose and the 2007 calculation. Changes are noted as increased tissue weights in red and reduced tissue weights in green. Of interest to us are the lists of tissues that are potentially directly exposed in the maxillofacial area, and these are highlighted in yellow. What I'd like you to note here is that we have several newly weighted tissues that are exclusively in the maxillofacial area. The um, perhaps most prominent of these tissues 
are the salivary glands, which are given an independent weight. But in addition, we have the extrathoracic airway, and we have buccal mucosa, oral mucosa, now included in the remainder group of tissues that are utilized in the 2007 calculation. In total, there are four additional weighted tissues in the maxillofacial area in the 2007 calculation. These tissues contribute to a 10% increase in the weight in terms of calculation, but when adjusted for the distribution of those tissues, three of them being almost exclusively in the maxillofacial area, result in a 28% increase in weight regardless of the size of the field of view there is an increase in risk using the 2007 calculation. That risk is magnified in smaller fields of view that are more closely focused on the dental alveolar areas because of the presence of salivary glands, buccal mucosa, and the extrathoracic airway in that area. But even the largest fields of view uh, result in a substantial increase in the calculation of risk using the 2007 uh, ICRP tissue weights. This graphic illustrates the sources or the components of dose in the calculation of uh, effective dose. And you can see that approximately 40% of the total effective dose is accounted for by thyroid tissues and bone marrow. An additional 55% of dose is accounted for by salivary glands and remainder tissues. The other tissues contributing a very small proportion of the total risk of exposure to this area. When we examine the distribution of dose uh, to weighted tissues and look at the variable of field of view size, we see that there is a decrease in the proportion of dose coming from the bone marrow and thyroid tissues as we, we reduce the size of the field of view. On the other hand, as we reduce the size of the field of view, we see an increase in the proportion of dose contributed by salivary glands and remainder tissues. This graphic illustrates what we might expect that other things remaining unchanged as we reduce the size of our volume, limit the field of view, we have a reduction in dose. This graphic illustrates another important component in dose and that is resolution. High resolution is desirable for many of the diagnostic tasks, but we can see that there is a dose trade-off that in this instance when we reduce voxel dimensions by one half, we have a concomitant increase in dose by about three and a half times. The reason for this is the need to increase photon fluence to maintain an adequate contrast to noise ratio in our image. While there are other variables that contribute to dose from comb beam CT, the single most important variable is selection of patients for the exam. The lack of selection criteria for many diagnostic tasks has generated some concern both in the profession 
and for the lay public. Here's an example um, of an article in the New York Times that focuses on routine use of comb beam C uh, for orthodontic patients. Most of um, orthodontic patients fall into uh, the adolescent demographic and there is concern that these young patients are at a higher risk for late developing cancers. In this graphic you can see that that increased risk may be anywhere from two to ten times the risk of a mature adult. There are a number of issues with the increasing use of comb beam CT in dentistry. One is that we have a technology that is in its relative infancy in terms of dental practice. And as yet, the scientific studies needed to validate increased efficacy in diagnosis and patient management is not available. Another issue is the danger of overuse of this technology because of its convenience, its presence in the dental office, um, as well as economic pressures to uh, appropriately utilize the device um, and enhance revenue stream. Other issues uh, that contribute to our concern with excessive dose would be inadequate training of personnel um, and a uh, lack of understanding of biological implications of uh, patient exposures. A number of approaches can be taken to minimizing dose and maximizing diagnostic information from dental comb beam exams. First, dental practitioners need to be educated in this technology to understand what the technology can do in terms of helping them with patient diagnosis and management. But two, those involved in uh, actually making the images need to be educated in the technical factors that permit reduction in dose. We need scientific study to demonstrate what the limits of dose reduction are that still allow adequate diagnosis. And finally, we need to develop high yield criteria that will guide practitioners in the appropriate selection of patients for this technology. So some final thoughts that I'll leave you with. Radiographic imaging is the largest source of ionizing radiation examination of patients today in the US. Fortunately for us, most of those examinations are relatively low dose. However, even a low dose when multiplied by the huge number of patients that are seen in dental offices annually results in a potentially significant public health issue. We can help to minimize the risk of these uh, examinations including the increased use of comb beam CT by applying OLARA principles and keeping our doses as low as possible through technical means and as importantly by the appropriate selection of patients for these exams.